and these dances that we do together, it's all about like attunement and knowing that sometimes our needs might shift and might change and we have to be present with our partner. You're listening to Make Some Noise Podcast, episode number 427 with guest Melissa Parks. Welcome to Make Some Noise Podcast, your guide for strategies, tools, and insight to empower yourself. I'm your host, Andrea Owen, global speaker, entrepreneur, life coach since 2007, and author of three books that have been translated into 18 languages and are available in 22 countries. Each week, I'll bring you a guest or a lesson that will help you maximize unshakable confidence, master resilience, and make some noise in your life. You ready? Let's go. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad that you are here. Hey, if you are enjoying this series, I think we're only on the third episode at this point. There's several more to come. But if you know anyone who is interested in therapeutic modalities for healing or just people who are interested in sort of the advanced personal development, healing, therapy, all that good stuff. I would be so grateful if you shared with them this podcast and let them know about this particular theme of episodes that we are doing. Thank you so much. Also, I have a really exciting announcement. So I have decided to open registration for not just one, but two Daring Way retreats. That's right. One is going to be in May. And there's going to be a second one in September of this year that is focused on recovery. I asked you to sign up for advanced notification to give me kind of a gauge. Is anybody interested? Is anybody out there? And you responded. And a fair amount of you said that you would be interested in coming to one of these retreats that was focused on addiction, sobriety, recovery. So that one is in September. I also wanted to open up registration at the same time for those because I didn't want the people to uh, sign up for the first one. I didn't want it to be confusing. So I'm going to not say any more words about it, less make you more confused and just tell you where to go. <laughs> I'm recording this about a week ahead of time, and we are we are just working our hearts out here to get the page ready for you to sign up. And for those of you that signed up for first notification for advanced notice, If registration was open, you already know. You got the email that said, hey, we're opening registration on this day, and then registration opened. I highly doubt that we have already opened registration up by the time this episode drops on February 2nd. However, it will be shortly after that. So it's at andreaowen.com slash retreat for the regular retreat. And there will be a link on there for people who are interested in the recovery one. Um, and the recovery retreat is at andreaowen.com slash recovery dash retreat. Okay. If you are confused, no worries. Shoot an email to emily at andreaowen.com. Emily is the one who is my right-hand woman, and we we decided she was just going to be – you have direct access to her email because <laughs> I know time is of the essence here to sign up because there are only 12 spots for each retreat, okay? And if you are somebody who is in recovery, but you can't make those September dates, they don't work, then by all means, sign up for the May retreat. But if you are someone who is not in recovery – or struggles with any kind of addiction, and you can't make the May retreat, you can sign up for the recovery retreat, but do know that we are going to be focusing on recovery and sobriety. The curriculum is going to be the same for both retreats, but most, if not all of the people who are coming to the September retreat we're going to be focused on that. So that means, you know, as we talk about shame stories, which is a lot of what the curriculum involves, they're going to be focused on that. So I just don't want you to feel left out. I don't want you to feel like, oh, okay, I'm the only one here who doesn't struggle with any kind of addiction. And truth be told, I'm a firm believer that we're all recovering from something. So it might be codependence that you have struggled with. It might be love addiction that you have struggled with. It might be an eating disorder that you have struggled with. All of those qualify you for 
the recovery treat that's in September. But I just wanted to let you know that a lot of the women in this community that will sign up for that retreat, including myself, have struggled the most. Uh, their focus will be around drinking. But again, any any kind of disordered relationship that you have had with a process or substance can be included in recovery. I hope that I'm not confusing. <laughs> I hope that, that 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 was all clear. At any rate, all of the information is at andreaowen.com slash retreat for the one in May, and that's just general daring way retreat. And then andreaowen.com slash recovery dash retreat is the daring way retreat in September that's going to focus on recovery. <laughs> All right, I have another therapist for you. I met Melissa Parks on TikTok and she kept popping up in my For You page and had such amazing advice and insight and wisdom. I reached out to her to see if she wanted to be on the show and she said yes. So for those of you who don't know her, let me tell you a little bit about her. Melissa Parks is a licensed therapist in South Carolina that specializes in emotionally focused couples therapy and trauma therapy using EMDR and somatic experiencing. She has been practicing as a clinician for 18 years and has recently incorporated coaching into her services for those looking to grow and heal outside of the therapeutic space. She reaches her communities on social media through a mix of education, humor, and compassion, and she wants everyone to realize what they do and how they are in the the world makes so much sense. So without further ado, here is Melissa. <laughs> Melissa, thank you so much for being here. Yes, I'm so glad to be here. Yay! Uh, we were chatting before I started recording and you are another person that I will follow it on TikTok and invited to be on the show. There's been a, a few therapists that I've tapped on the shoulder and I, I really appreciate the, just the medium in general. And I appreciate you, you coming on and I have a lot of questions and I know we don't know each other. So I'll just tell you, like, I like to dive right into the deep end. <laughs> I've had some yeah, experts on there. Like, oh, you ask like the big questions. <laughs> like, yes. But I, I just want to start with can you talk to us about the the healing modality of of EMDR and can you kind of tell us what it looks like uh, on a like a logistical level like what do people do can you do it virtually and and what is it actually doing to the body and the brain let's start with EMDR so EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing and it's um it's an evidence based psychotherapy model. So that just means it's got lots of research behind it, lots of proven outcomes, and it's used to treat things like trauma, complex trauma, but also other things like depression, chronic anxiety, stuckness, um, sets of symptoms associated with like overactivation of the nervous system. So not only like um, you think of anxiety, but maybe people pleasing, over-functioning in relationships. So sets of symptoms like that, or, or under activation of the nervous system, like I said, depression, um, a sense of stuckness, lack of motivation. So um, it's not just a trauma model, which is really lovely. Uh, a lot of people, when they think EMDR, they think trauma therapy, but it's not just for trauma. So that's, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've heard of that whether or, or not, but that's sometimes enlightening for folks. I think I only know it in, in the realm of, mm -hmm. of trauma. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that it can even help people who maybe haven't experienced like acute trauma or anything like that, but, but do struggle yes. with anxiety yes. and depression. So it's based on a model or a theory that says within us is a natural information processing system. So this system will take distressing experiences and process them. We talk about it. We feel about it. We think about it. We even dream about it. And then we take that experience and we store it in our explicit memory where we have recall. So we're able to have a coherent narrative and we can move on and we can say that was then and this is now. And the symptoms that we are struggling with based on this model says that this is due to unprocessed memories or experiences. So at some point, this natural system that we have kind of got interrupted a little bit. And so it wasn't able to integrate the experience in a way that kind of tells us that was then and this is now. And as a result, we have all these symptoms popping up in our present that really belong connected to the experience and in the past. Um, 
And so these fragmented pieces kind of show up for us um, and, and become really problematic and, and become these symptoms that mm-hmm. sort of plague us in our day to day. And EMDR helps us by sort of setting up this brain state in session um, where we can kind of have another go at processing the experience or the memory or whatever it is that we're struggling with. So we, it's almost as if we're activating the memory or activating the thing that we didn't get to process again, but in a way that feels safe, that feels, um, but it's not overwhelming. And then we're able to have this coherent narrative again. And so that we can not again, but we have, Mm -hmm. we're able to create this coherent narrative so that we can move on and that these symptoms won't pop up for us anymore. Is it kind of, when you were describing that, I was thinking of like unclogging a drain. Is that a fair? Yeah, I like that metaphor. (laughs) metaphor? I do. I like that metaphor. Yeah. At at some point, our natural system where we would kind of like flush through and, and, and get things moving through kind of got something happened, something, the, the experience that we were having was just so upsetting and so overwhelming that it created this clog. Right. Right. And it, and it, and, Mm -hmm. And so it's not that there's something wrong with us. It's just that, that something was so overwhelming right. that our beautiful nervous system came along and decided, you know what, keeping this thing all together is just too much. We're going to fragment this into pieces and we're going to make it a little bit more survivable in this way. That's how we're going to move on from here. Okay. And so what is it? What do you actually do during the process? Can you kind of walk us through if you were meeting with a client to do that? specifically? That's a big question because really EMDR, when we think of EMDR, we might think of like someone waving our hand, their hands in front of our face or tapping on us or something. And sure, that's a component of EMDR because that's what's called bilateral stimulation. So we're activating and integrating information from both the left and the right side of the brain. And we're, we're doing that by these, these movements where we're stimulating um, both sides of the brain with tapping or sounds or um, like I said, moving the eyes, but that's phase four. I mean, some of that can be involved in phase two too, but, um, EMDR as a model is all is eight phases. So from the day one, when you walk through the door, we're just taking a history We're we're looking at you through that lens that you make sense and everything that you've experienced and your symptoms, um, all, uh, your, your current symptoms are, based on these unprocessed experiences. And so we're looking at you through that lens and we're taking a history and that's part of EMDR. And then, you know, as we move through these phases based on um, different, different things, I mean, we're certainly going to go slower if you've had more complex trauma. Um, If you've had intense neglect and you, you don't have the capacity to, let's say, uh, just sort of feel like you can function day to day, we're probably going to move a little bit slower than let's say somebody who um, maybe feels like they're functioning okay, but they're just having a little bit of a hard time. We're taking a history. We're doing some things to help you with coping in the day to day as if you can sort of feel like maybe you can find a little bit of regulation or soothing throughout the day. So we might be giving you some practical tools in some of the sessions. Uh, so that you can cope with whatever might come up through an EMDR reprocessing session. And then the actual act of um, desensitizing a memory or desensitizing the thing that maybe is feeling like got you stuck in the first place involves more of this bilateral stimulation. And that can be different things, right? Do some therapists use? Because I remember when when I did it, it was two uh-huh. vibrating, pulsing things in each hand, and they would they would vibrate. Yes, opposite that's right. Each other. Um, so I use a lot of the time. A lot of the research is is behind the eye movements. That that's where most of the research is. But mm-hmm. um, definitely, you can be using the tactile stimulation. So it's the buzzers or someone tapping on your knees. Um, there's so many different options and, um, there's so many, so much more research actually coming out of, you know, not only 
using bilateral stimulation, but just uh, what's called dual attention stimulus. So it's something that's keep that's helping okay. me hold this really difficult experience. But in order to desensitize it, the therapist is going to distract you with something. So maybe it's bilateral stimulation, but it can hmm. also be something that's called a dual attention stimulus, where it's like, I'm asking you to say TikTok, 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 TikTok throughout the session, as I ask you to hold this really distressing experience and maybe wave my fingers in front of your eyes. So um, all of that. Yeah, it sounds kind of intense. Uh, it's It's very interesting. And a lot of the research is just very compelling. So yeah, I'm really, I love EMDR. I encourage a lot of people to look into it. I've had, I've had a lot of clients or people that have come to my retreats have such great things to say about it. So I think it, it's a great um, option for a lot of people. I'm interrupting this conversation to tell you about one of our affiliates. So I've been talking to you about meal kits here on the show, and I want to tell you specifically why I love Freshly. First and foremost, they're not a meal kit. They are meals that come already prepared, and they're heat and eat in three minutes or less. I know. I've been using them consistently since at least 2018. It might have even been before that. And I just, I'm mildly obsessed with them. I tell everyone about them. <laughs> So, okay, first and foremost, every single meal is gluten-free, if that is important to you. Their chefs cleverly swap and sneak in veggies to craft meals with unexpected twists. So every bit of it is as nutritious as it is delicious. There is little waste and everything is recyclable. You can also pick how many meals you want. You can pick what day of the week you want them delivered, and you don't have to get multiples of the same meal. So my husband and I and the kids like different meals. So I just pick all of their favorites. So we've tried almost all of them, I think. And my favorites are the buffalo chicken with cauliflower mashed potatoes, any of their risottos. I'm 100% obsessed with their steak peppercorn. My husband loves their K-Town pork and purple sticky rice and the chicken Livorno. Those are probably his favorites. My daughter loves the steak peppercorn, although she picks the peppercorns out because they're they're a little they're a little spicy for her. Um but and they do have vegetarian options too if that's if that's your thing. So if you head on over to andreaowen.com slash Freshly, you can get 30% off your first order. I love Freshly so much, I could talk about them for five minutes, but I will not. I will not. Let's get back to the conversation. <laughs> andreaowen.com slash Freshly and get 30% off your first order. If you like to consume podcasts, which I'm assuming that you do because you're here, if you do, I think you would love audiobooks if you have not found them already. Audible has a free trial. You can try it for 30 days for $0, and then you can get two free audiobooks with Premium Plus. All three of my books are over there on Audible, 52 Ways to Live a Kick-Ass Life, How to Stop Feeling Like Shit, and Make Some Noise, plus most of the books I recommend here on this show and my guests' books are over there as well. After 30 days, you get one audiobook a month for $14.95 a month, and you receive 30% off the price of additional audiobook purchases, and you can cancel at any time. Easy peasy. Your books are yours to keep even if you cancel. Go to andreaowen.com slash audible to sign up for your free trial. That's andreaowen.com slash audible. I know in your social media, you talk a lot and teach a lot about the different attachment styles. So can you, can you briefly like go through what those are and can someone be a combination of a couple of them? Before I say anything about the styles, I would definitely like to say that attachment styles are more like strategies. So we've come to learn through our relating typically with the people that matter the most that to figure out how to get our needs met for connection and survival, we may have had to adapt and we may have had to figure out different mm -hmm. strategies to do so based on maybe what we weren't getting or we're getting too much of. And most of what I'm talking about is in childhood, but of course our attachment strategies may change when we're in different relationships, certainly in adulthood. So to answer your question, that first part about can we be different? Can we use different strategies or may we have different attachment styles? The answer is yes. I may be one style with my partner, but be a completely different style with my boss. And, and the, so the answer is yes. So these, th these 
styles, these strategies are fluid. Um, they may change, they may ebb mm-hmm. and flow. And, um, and I can certainly go from an insecure attachment style to a secure attachment style. Absolutely. That's kind of the goal, right? Is to like, hopefully mostly be in the secure attachment right. style, maybe like, you know, what, 75% we're, of the time. We're hoping, <laughs> we're hoping. A good I, outcome. Think the, I think the goal is to move from rigidity to more consistency. That's what we're looking for. I think, um, like, or what does that mean? Can you say more about that? Maybe, um, well, sometimes when we're thinking about these attachment styles, um, there we're, we're very rigid with, with things or, or we might even be inconsistent. So we're either rigid or we're inconsistent. That's where really the problem is, is across the board, rigidity is something that's, um, you know, just not, that's not what a nervous system thinking about nervous system health. That's not what a nervous right. system and just like humans, yeah, that's in not general. what a nervous system, a healthy mm-hmm. nervous system looks like we want to have, we might be triggered into something and that's okay. But can we come to a place where we can sort of move through that in a, in a way that feels okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but es- essentially going back to the strategies. So there's four of them. There's anxious, avoidant, disorganized, and secure. And this comes from the work of John Bowlby, the father of attachment. But Mm -hmm. we adapt with our anxious, with an anxious style when our caregivers have kind of shown up with lots of their own activation and it goes unchecked, perhaps maybe in the form of like fears and worries and that manifests in the home. And so maybe they do respond emotionally to me sometimes but sometimes they don't and it's very inconsistent and it's unpredictable. And so what results for those anxious folks is like this heightened awareness of, am I going to get the love or am I not? And so they're constantly looking out for that. Mm -hmm. So would those people grow up to, in their adult relationships, be um, like poor boundaries, uh, pleasers, they kind of bend to whatever their part, whatever they think their partner wants them to be. And this is what you might see in a big the big word these days is like codependent. Um, and so it's not like I'm knocking codependency. Mm-hmm. I think we have a lot to learn from that topic and a lot to learn from that. But when it comes to our attachment, when it comes to relating, I feel like that that's more of a harsher lens because um, we are meant to be in relationship where we are meant to depend on someone mm-hmm. and that's okay. It's okay to depend, but it's also okay to, to be independent both. So we want to think about this, this, I want to be okay in the world on my own, but it's also okay if I'm waiting for someone and, and needing the help of somebody too. both of those things can be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, what you're, what you're sort of talking about, it sounds like I'm talking about myself is what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I, I describe that through personal experience <laughs> and being attracted to avoid it. And, and I way. love that, that we can talk about this too. This might be fun because. I actually am in the other camp personally, my home away from home. I've definitely worked on myself and I've gotten to that place where I have more of of a secure attachment, but my home away from home, my strategies come from more of that withdrawal or more from that avoidance side. And when we're talking about avoidantly Mm -hmm. adapted folks, they've experienced emotional barrenness, you know, in their, in their childhood, they may Mm -hmm. have gotten lots of attention and praise for being successful or being good but not a lot of help with emotions and understanding the inner workings of their inner world. None of that was reflected to them. And so they're sort of left, you know, knowing like relationships aren't going to help me with that. So there's no point and there's definitely no point of, of sharing that stuff. And so that's sort of where, where mm-hmm. the, and, mm-hmm. and some people look at that and, and cast these judgments on the avoidant folks and the withdrawer folks and say, Oh, they're so cold. And, and yet it's very sad to think about the experience and how they yeah. come to be the way they are. How they've adapted. Yeah. From, from childhood. Well, and the reason I know about this is because I am a love addict and I actually, long story short in 2007, I was, I was dating someone who went to the meadows and I went for family week and was introduced to love addiction. And I bought P. Melody's book, Facing Love Addiction at the bookstore and was reading it. And I was only into chapter one and I was like, oh my God, this is, this is my life. This is my behavior. The cycle that she has in there of like mm-hmm. the nine steps of the love addicted and love avoidant mm-hmm. relationship was exactly what I had experienced for over yeah. a decade 
in, in a long relationship that I was in. So I understand it deeply. And like you, I've done a lot of work and I feel like most of the time I spend in the secure yeah. place, but I've always been attracted to avoidance. And I find myself when things get a little dicey, I find myself going yeah. back into that yeah, yeah. anxious. Well, place. and it, you know, the, the brain likes familiarity, you know, um, and sometimes mm-hmm. it can go to sometimes familiarity feels safe. So when we feel like anxious or we feel maybe a little bit um, threatened, we might slip back into those, uh, th- those wirings. And that's, uh, that's not because we're bad. It's just because we make sense and, um, safe feels better. And sometimes familiarity will, will take us to those places. And it's also this unconscious drive of the nervous system to experience healing again, you know? Um, so yeah. I love that set, that phrase yeah. that we all make sense. It just feels good to say it. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's a great one. That I know. needs to go in a t-shirt. Um, okay. And so disor- a disorganized, I'm assuming is a combination of all three, or is it a combination of just um, avoidant and disorganized definitely doesn't have that secure um, at all. It's, it, I would say it's, it, it, you can see the components of both anxious and avoidant that the key is, is that there is absolutely, there's no consistency. I can't like for, for the avoidant folks, it's pretty consistent in terms of their strategies and how they show up. Mm-hmm. And same thing for anxious. It's pretty consistent in how they show up. For disorganized, you might see a little bit of the anxiety stuff or the anxiousness, and then you might see the avoidance stuff. It's, it's, you don't know what you're going to get. It's Interesting. so, and that, and that is because the disorganized style is all about the echoes of trauma, the experiences with a caregiver where the, caregiver was the scary person Mm -hmm. and out of control. And there was no repair and the brain and the nervous system got confused because a part of us, when we're scared, wants to go to our caregiver to get soothing and safety. But that caregiver is the very thing that's causing me fear. And so there's this freeze experience on the inside and without repair, we're left with all of that trapped nervous system activation. And that really is trauma. And when we take that with us without repair and we are triggered in certain ways as in our adult relationships and beyond, it makes so much sense why we have all these um, symptoms of like push, pull, and, and, and I want love, but I'm terrified of love, go away. And and all these ways that the disorganized um, adaptation will show up in relationship. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very painful. Sounds like it. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm thinking about, because I I think the people listening are probably... uh, are intrigued and also seeing themselves in your descriptions. And then the big question of like, okay, well, how does someone move into a secure attachment Mm -hmm. style? And, and Mm -hmm. I can just speak for myself and I'm curious what your thoughts are in this. This was even back before I knew these weren't buzzwords and I was working with my therapist and it was, it was a lot of talk therapy and just on a personal note, it was a lot of taking responsibility for my behaviors, but a ton of self-compassion, not making Mm -hmm. myself wrong for it working through shame I had for all these bad choices that I had made with um, men that I had been in relationships with. And, and then Mm. also I'm trying to think like, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy was a game changer for me personally, (laughs) because I have such high anxiety and, and the worksheets and just like walking through the thoughts of like, okay, what's the worst case scenario in this, (laughs) in this situation, Andrea, like, is this, you know, that type of just slowing down and kind of seeing my fears for what they really were and kind of like looking at them mm-hmm. right in the eye, that was super helpful. But I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. And then anything in addition to that, that people can look through. Well, I think that's wonderful. And I believe your experience to be 100% true that that is what helped you. And that's so great. And a lot of what you were talking about, all I was thinking was like that, you know, that's very like, you know, the CBT, it, the, all this, this work on metacognition, like figuring out what is it, what stories am I making up in my mm-hmm. head about this? And that is helpful. That's certainly helpful. Um, the other piece is that's equally as important as the piece where we do more of that, that stuff with your limbic system, which is the stuff that's on the bottom part of the brain, which is where, you know, we're, you know, all that nervous system stuff and how the body comes into play and, so it's not necessarily that sophisticated part of our brain. It's working with what's happening um, more primitively on the yeah. inside. That's very, very important too, because 
that's the part that shows up where we have zero control Mm -hmm. and that can create that experience of shame inside. Like, Oh, I knew better. I know that this is, this is a better way to think about it. And yet here I am having these reactions. So that's an important piece too. Yeah. But I love that you found CBT helpful for you. Um, I hear a lot of, 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 of knocking of CBT sometimes on these apps. And I think that's unfortunate because even in, for example, EMDR as a model, see, there's, there's, there's pieces of CBT incorporated in EMDR as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, I just love having options. And to be fair, when I can't believe it's been almost two years when the pandemic first hit, I, I, like many people had kind of um, an an uptick in my old behaviors and had to go through the process again of finding a therapist. And I specifically went through trauma therapy where we looked at like, when did this start? Like what was, what was Uh, happening? And so mm -hmm. we, you know, we found it, it was when I was 13 and stuff with my dad and, you know, just becoming a teenager and moving away from him and he wasn't there anymore. And like, and it was like, Oh, that's why. And then I turned to boys instead of my caregiver (laughs) to, you know, be Mm -hmm. my soft place to land, which doesn't always work out well. I mean, it doesn't always work out well with our, our parents and caregivers, unfortunately too. But for me, it was this steady and consistent caregiver in my life was suddenly not there anymore. And so yes, that's yes. what I figured out caught, like was really spurred the anxious attachment style and my love addiction of just like constantly looking for that high of somebody pay attention to me, someone love me. But what you're saying too is so beautiful because it almost takes us right back to what I was talking about with EMDR. When we experience difficult situations, whether they're categorized as trauma or not, we sometimes don't have a coherent narrative around them. Exactly. And what you're, mm-hmm. even if you use CBT, look at this beautiful coherent narrative that you came across, came upon. You took it back to your, your little, little girl at 13 and, and what, what she experienced and the difficulty with that and the pain with that. And then you also came up with this, this beautiful way of, of kind of outlining what your healing will be, even though you've experienced that, like, that's so lovely. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you. And I, I think what I'm realizing just now having this conversation with you is that the CBT was super helpful at the time, but it only Mm -hmm. took me so far because, you know, and, and I think it was going to come up eventually sooner or later, but the pandemic, I think with just the stress of everything, and maybe it was just where I was in my life, you know, like this middle age stuff, (laughs) malaise, existential crisis, whatever it was. Um, it became kind of like the CBT wasn't enough anymore. And that's when I knew like, okay, this is something that's deeper and I need to, I need to uncover it. Yes, 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 yes. I love the, the self-compassion piece as well. I think that's so important. And I love this balance where you're holding so tenderly the the, the idea of telling myself that I make sense mm-hmm. again with that self-compassion and maybe the nervous system perspective, but also you're selling, you're saying, I wanted to hold myself accountable yeah. and I wanted to own, I wanted to own, own some of the ways that I showed up in the world and not to judge them, but just to own them because that gives me a sense of empowerment. And it gives me a sense of feeling like, you know, I can, I can, I can move through this. And I love that too. Exactly. Yeah. I like the way that you articulated that. Well, can, can you give us some examples of what might like someone with unhealthy attachment styles, like in a partnership, whether they're married or just in a long-term relationship, can you give us some examples either made up or that you see in your clients where things can get can kind of like go off the rails a little bit. And like when you see people land in, in your office, I think it's important to note here that the conflict necessarily isn't the concern because we can create more richness within or resulting from conflict. But the key with these, um, these insecure attachment styles is the disconnection within the relationship. That's that's where the the issues stem from. And when our strategies come from that deeply wounded place and we're wired almost to anticipate and live in the disconnection, that's where that rigidness is coming from. Um, That's the issue. That's where these unhealthy, and I'm doing air quotes, Mm -hmm. um, um, attachment styles, insecure attachment styles can begin to really wreak havoc. So we really need to figure out how we can break out of those those patterns of relating they show up even in my marriage in the day to day. Mm -hmm. Um, but the key is, is that I, we catch the ruptures quicker, but those with insecure attachment styles tend to not catch the ruptures and repair them. 
And so it can show up in the day to day. Um, maybe somebody buys something without letting the other person know. And it's part of their shared goals to like be open about purchases or something. But maybe the more insecure avoidant person isn't in touch with their hurt about that. And rather it's like anger and frustration. And based on that anger and frustration, they pull away from their partner Mm -hmm. because they've learned to not get in touch with their inner world. And they've learned that even if I did and I go to my person, there's emotional barrenness. It's not going to work anyway. So Mm -hmm. might as well pull away. And so there's an example. And then if we, we take that from the anxious side, let's say the anxious person notices, hey, where's my partner? They're withdrawn. And their alarm bells start screaming to them, right? Danger, danger. Uh-huh. Because they I'm laughing because I've so been there so many times. I plan out like I, I'll go so far within like 30 seconds. I've planned out like which apartment complex I'm going to move into because I'm convinced that my husband's going to leave me. Exactly. It hasn't exactly. happened in a while, listen, but I remember a couple of years ago. Yeah. Like listen to that, that all that hyperactivation, that nerve, that dysregulation, because they're so hypersensitive to, to disconnection. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what that means. Are they going to be there? Are they not going to be there? And instead of learning how to regulate, because they weren't taught how to regulate by their caregiver, they they go to their partner with criticism, anger, so much accusation. Like serving- yeah. Exactly. And they're serving their partner this plate that's so freaking hot that the partner up n- has n- no other choice but to drop it. Um, and so that's a great just day to day example. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, and we're just talking about like buying something that we, so it can show up with anything. I buy something that I forgot to tell you about. I told you I was going to take the garbage out and I didn't. Um, I, um, I'm, I, I text you the wrong words about something, or, I mean, it can show up in any little way, but the bottom line is, is I sense the disconnection and I don't know how to communicate clearly and give you a clear signal about what pain that causes me. And then I, I do so in a way that I either avoid altogether or I come at you too hot. And then we're just off to the races going, Mm -hmm. going, going. So, yeah. Yes. I see so much of myself and I'm sure people listening can see maybe themselves too. I, I, I did realize when the first time that my husband and I had a disagreement and he was upset with me about something more specifically, he was upset with me and I didn't go down that path of he's going to leave me. I, I didn't like that he was upset with me and I, I knew, but I knew that we could fix it and I knew he wasn't going anywhere. And I'm like, this is just a normal. And I remember when it happened, I was like, am I secure? Is this secure attachment style? (laughs) Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's happened several times now and I'm so proud of myself. Yeah. And that is like one of those things, like if, if we think about from that wiring perspective that we're sort of wired with these old patterns, we need to make explicit those new patterns that we create. It's almost like digging a ditch and we need to celebrate Mm -hmm. that. We need to say, oh my gosh, look at what we just did here. Like I was, what, what do you think about what, what we just did here? Do you see that? And, and celebrate that together. Yeah. We talk about it. Like I tell, I told him how exciting that was. That's that's wonderful. Yeah. Another thing too, that I was a pattern of mine that I'm, I'm, I'm assuming is a common pattern, especially with people who identify as women. I always felt it was my responsibility to take care of his feelings. Yeah. Totally. Yes. 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 And now what I do is so like, if I knew that he was upset about something, even if I was not the cause of it, I would do this dance of like trying to do whatever I could to make him feel better, to make him comfortable. And now I understand that I'm like, he's an adult. He is capable of regulating himself. It is not my responsibility. I'm not, he's not a baby. I'm not his mother. And yes, I'm yes, able yes, to walk yes. away with him knowing that I'm here if he needs me, but like knowing that he needs time to himself to process and that I'm not going anywhere. He's not going. It feels so safe now, which is another, was a huge milestone for me several years ago in our, in our marriage. That's a big deal. And I love that. And it, and it's another thing that came up for me while you were talking about that is like, we're each couple is very different and just as each nervous system is very different. And I love that we're, you're able to see and know what works for your partner mm-hmm. and, and maybe be in tune with that. Um, because, you know, we can slap these like rigid statements of like, 
don't help. We don't need to help them with this or whatever, but maybe in a moment, I see that typically I'd like to let him kind of, you know, work out his own feelings, but maybe in a moment I look at his face and I see, I think there's struggle there. Maybe I go, go towards this one time to see, are you okay? Do you need help with this? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to leave you alone in this. I know we kind of typically take our time to do that, but I feel like you need me right now. Yeah. And just lo and behold, in that moment, yes, he does. And and that's just the thing is, is that there's the, in these dances that we do together, um, it's all about like attunement and knowing that sometimes our needs might shift and might change. And, and we have to be, uh, we have to be um, present yeah. with our partner. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. very true. Thank you for, for saying that. And, and I want to, um, before we close up, I want to ask you a question about, cause I love when people can take things, practical things and tools into their, into their lives as they walk away from this, this conversation. And so I know that you help your clients with somatic tools and skills. So can you talk about some of them mm-hmm. and, and when someone might use them? Yeah, I just did a TikTok. On this <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> we'll link to it in the show notes. <laughs> Because this won't come out um, for another yeah. few weeks. <laughs> um, I think one of the main ways that I help people in terms of that somatic journey and connecting with their body is through like tracking and um, settling like patterns of autonomic activation. So just being able to just kind of get to know your nervous system and get to know what happens on the inside, whether it's just like in a moment or if it's in a moment of being triggered. And one of the ways that we do that. Um, is it would be in sessions where I would kind of lead them through a settling exercise of like maybe orienting to their space, which is what I did on the TikTok, kind of looking around, letting the eyes kind of um, just take in the space and then just starting to sort of notice and recognize and turn their focus inward just to see what sort of sensations are there. Um, And of course that can be triggering to some people. So it's, it's again, very nervous system specific, we have to see like what feels good for some people and what feels off for some people, but even just doing like a tracking kind of like seeing and noticing what's happening on the inside, but other like practical, tangible tools would be things like self holding exercises, you know, where I'm actually like placing a hand maybe on a certain part of my body, or I'm sort of like, I'm kind of experiencing like a, a, like a sort of self hug to kind of feel the boundaries of my body and my skin. Um, uh, We can work with different sounds. There's the sounds of voo and voo ah. And, you know, if you, if you uh, Googled somatic experiencing exercises, you'd probably Mm -hmm. see a whole host of things online, but those would be like, don't you have a TikTok playlist of those specific? I think I do. I think you do. (laughs) Or I might be confusing you with another do. practitioner, but I could have sworn that you had one that was titled, um, you know, somatic exercises or things that you can do at home. And uh, yeah, those are great. Thank you. Yeah, 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 of course. Before we close up, and I, I want you to definitely tell everybody where they can find more of you. I'm asking this question to all the experts I'm having on my show as we're talking about this topic around trauma and healing. And the question is, in your words, Melissa, how do we heal? Oh, okay. And I almost don't want to make it so like, so magical sounding. Cause I feel like healing happens in a moment. Mm-hmm. Like I really do. Um, and, and, and I can, in one moment where I can experience healing the next moment, I can experience like a feeling of setback. So how can we experience healing? We can experience healing through relationships. Certainly things that are hurt in relationship must be healed in relationship, but we can also experience healing on our own. We can experience healing through connecting with our, just on a day-to-day, like mindfulness kind of way, like um, noticing what I'm feeling in a moment is, is something that's very healing or even just um, noticing um, you know, how something shows up in my body, whether it's quote unquote, good or bad, I think is an experience of healing because it brings awareness. So I just feel like healing doesn't have to be something that's magical or mystical. I think it's something that happened can happen at any moment and any time and is very subjective. And, um, you know, I also don't want anyone to think that it's like follow these five things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's very personal. Yeah. 
I absolutely agree with that last part. It's very personal. Um, it doesn't have a specific timeline. Yeah. As much as I yeah. would like it to. <laughs> yeah. And it also isn't a plate like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm going to be doing healing work for the rest of my life. And that's okay. I think that's lovely. I don't think, I don't think that that's a bad thing. I, I'll never arrive. I've yeah. always things to learn because I'm constantly messing up and that's okay because life is messy and mm-hmm. relationships are messy and um, and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much. This has been so helpful and informative. And I know that people have seen bits and pieces of themselves and what you were talking about. So where do you want people to go to find you? And of course, all these links are going to be in the show notes. I would say the main place would be, um, you know, either probably Instagram. Cause I have a lot of my, um, a lot of my links there. I've got a upcoming cohort based course, which I'm super excited. The first of its kind in terms of my work. And so for people that want to work with me that can't work with me in a therapy perspective, but can want to do a coaching, um, kind of perspective. That's so like an online so, like group program yep. that you meet live yep. online. Yep. Awesome. Six week. Yep. Yes. I'm so excited. Um, I've been working so hard on it, but um, Instagram is probably the best way. So Melissa Park says, but of course I'm on TikTok. I've, um, I've got a, a following there and then I'm on Facebook too, but I'm mostly active on Instagram and, and TikTok and TikTok. Okay. Awesome. So, yeah. Um, as we said, we'll put all those links in the show notes. And when does your group start by the way? I definitely think mid February or the, at the latest March 1st. Perfect. Thank you so much. We'll put the link in the show notes to the cohort and your, your socials and all that. And everyone, thank you so much for your time. It's so important. And I value you so much for being here. I'm so incredibly grateful. And remember it's our life's journey to make ourselves better humans and our life's responsibility to make the world a better place. Bye everybody. Hey everyone. Thanks again for listening to the show. And just a quick reminder that if your company needs a speaker or a trainer, I might be the right person for you. I speak and do keynotes on confidence and resilience for mixed audiences, as well as do trainings on The Daring Way, which is the methodology based on the research of Dr. Brene Brown. So if you think it might be a good fit, hit me up at support at andreaowen.com or head over to my speaking page, andreaowen.com slash speaking.